he gets home, it says that the town where they are um, is stirred about it. So it's kind of like, oh, look, they're back. You know, oh, look, that's mom. You know, I'm telling my mom. What are you going to do? And in that society, you have what was called a kinsman redeemer. And this is what, this is what Naomi was talking about with, uh, with her daughters-in-law. She was saying, you know, if, if a son passed away, then the next available one would marry so that the family line could continue. Um, and so she was like, I don't have anybody. And then it would just kind of keep going. Um, there was like this order. It's kind of like the royal family, right? When you're looking at the, the throne, like, what, where, where are you in line? There was kinsmen redeemers that were in line. And so, um, and so she comes back and they say, oh, Naomi. And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Naomi meant um, pleasant and Mara means bitter. Okay, so she says, well, I'm going to change my name. I'm not pleasant anymore. The Lord's hand has been against me, and and so um, so she's sad, she's mourning, she's you know all of these things, and so Ruth says, "I'm going to care for you." And so she goes out and she begins to glean um, grain, and so as she's doing that, she she just happens upon just happens upon um, this field, and she begins gleaning, and the owner of the field, Boaz, comes along. And he goes, "Who's that girl?" And they go, "Oh, that's that's Ruth." She came back with Naomi. He goes, "Oh." He says, I've heard. I've heard of her. I've heard of what she is doing for Naomi. Um, and so and so she um, so he calls her over and he says, Hey, don't go anywhere else. Stay with our field. Um, and he tells the men, he was like, leave some grain behind. Don't get on door. She picks up extra grain. Leave her alone. Give her what she needs. Like all of this stuff. And he begins to take care of her. And um, in Ruth, chapter 2, verse 12, this is Boaz talking to her. He says, May the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And so in her moment of distress, in her loss of everything that she had, her, her basically her source of income, her source of protection, her source of everything was just taken away from her. She says, No, no, there's a God that you serve. And that's where I'm going to go. And so she goes there, and then Boaz hears of this, and he tells her, you sought refuge from the Lord, and it's going to be provided for you. And so he goes about um, this process of seeing, am I the kinsman redeemer? And Naomi's like, oh, he is a kinsman. Okay, so Naomi's, Naomi's uh, life is beginning to change also. So this hopelessness that she felt as she changed her name to Mara, to bitter, she begins to see how the God is how that how God is continuing to provide for her through this, and so so Ruth and Boaz uh, get married, um, and if you follow the story further, you see that Ruth and Boaz have a son uh, whose name is Obed, and then Obed has a son whose name is Jesse, and then Jesse has a son whose name is David, and so you see that this Moabite woman. This person who is uh, not an Israelite by birth comes in and she gets to be a part of the lineage of Christ because of what she saw um, in, in as she sought refuge in the Lord in the middle of her stress. And so what was her response? Uh, I don't think that anybody here is has not been hit by death in some way. Whether it's an immediate family member or um, you know a co-worker, somebody in our extended family. Death is a really um, big part of life. Um, growing up, Dad was a pastor, and uh, for the most part, our churches have always been predominantly older people. And um, and so, death was something that I was very familiar with. You know, they would they would bring um, they would bring the body bodies to the church. You know, early for to get ready for visitation, different things like that. And so, these were all people that I knew and loved. And so, I would go and. Just talk with them. And I was just like, you know, this is a part of life. And because these people knew the Lord, I knew that this was not the end for them. I knew that there was more for them. So I knew that Miss Folks, I was going to see her again. I knew that Miss Mitchell, I was going to see her again. I knew that Mary Ann was somebody that I was going to see again. I knew that Brother Wayne was somebody that I was going to see and that Nancy was somebody that I was going to see. And those were all people that I knew and loved. And because of their faith in the Lord, 
And because of the example that they set for me, I had the ability to have a relationship with the Lord. And so, so their example through their service and through loving me and through teaching me helped me to come to a point where I recognized that I was a sinner and needed a Savior also. And so their life that they lived all the way to the end, serving the Lord, served as an example for me so that I can continue that in the future. And so that's what we see here um, with Ruth. Is Ruth says, okay, just because my husband's life and my father-in-law's life and my brother-in-law's life ended, that's not the end of us. We're going to continue to serve. I'm going to continue to love Naomi in the ways that she's loved me. And I'm going to do those things, and the Lord continues to provide for her. Our third one is Mary. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, but Mary had uh, several life curveballs thrown at her. Um, you know, Mary was a, a young person, depending on which scholars you read, they estimate anywhere from like 12 to 17. Um, and so Mary is a young girl. Uh, she is um, betrothed to Joseph, and so it's kind of like the engagement. Um, and so she's betrothed to Joseph, but during that, you know, they're, they're not having sex. And so um, then Gabriel shows up. And so Gabriel shows up and he says, hey, P.S., um, you're going to have a kid. And she's like, but I've never slept with anyone. That's going to be a problem. Um, and he's like, no, it's, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but if, I, if yeah, anywhere in my teens, if the Lord had come to me and said that's what's going to happen, uh, my mind is completely blown. And um, teaching teenagers, they don't handle things like that very well. Um any kind of change. Like if you say, you know, we're going to have our test today instead of tomorrow. What? Like, like their world falls apart. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, but we see her response. Um, we see all of this, this account in Luke 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. But in verse 38, we see this, the first part of it. It says, and Mary said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. I cannot imagine that response. She's completely yielding. And you have to remember, in this time, there's been this silence, right? So from the book of Malachi um, until, until they go, uh, the angel goes and talks to Zechariah, there's been silence, right? And so just first of all, that oh, an angel showed up. Hey, that's new. Um, that hasn't happened in, in quite some time. But the angel shows up and talks to her and tells her these things. She doesn't freak out um, that we see here in Scripture. She doesn't go, but this isn't my plan. She doesn't say, but what about Joseph? She doesn't say, what are the people going to say? She doesn't say any of these things that would I feel like would be my natural response. You know, um, she doesn't do those things. She has complete trust in the Lord. And then she is completely yielding to his plan. Now, if you follow the story of Mary, you see that it still doesn't continue to go the way that she kind of thought it was going to go. Um, and I love this. When, when you read uh, the story, there are two different times that, um, that it says that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And you have to think that, that, that it had to be ridiculously difficult to parent the Messiah. Right? Especially with the other siblings. Because no matter what conflict is going on, it's not Jesus' fault. Ever. Like, he never, like, if we're saying Jesus started it, no, he didn't. Like, Jesus is perfect. He is sinless. So none of these things. So in any of the other, like, so here comes James. And he's like, but Jesus said, no. If Jesus said it, then it was true because we're going to side with Jesus. Even if it's like, well, Joseph said, well, we're going to take Jesus' word over Joseph's because he's the Messiah. Um, so you have to imagine that had to be difficult, parenting the Messiah. Um, knowing that if I'm having an argument with Jesus, I'm automatically wrong in this situation. You know, anytime I, I have an argument with the, with the girls, I'm right because I'm the mom. Like, that's just sort of where we draw the line. But that doesn't work when you're parenting Jesus. And so then as they continue to go through life, you know, and, and Jesus becomes a carpenter along with Joseph because that's what, that's what you did in the society. You, you take on the, the role that your father did, and, she, and he begins doing those things, and then he leaves that. And it's like, this isn't the way this works. It's not the plan that we have. And then he goes and he begins doing this ministry, and this ministry doesn't have a home. It's, he just kind of goes from place to place. 
and then he's only going to do this for three years? I don't understand this. And, and now everyone hates him? I don't get it. And now they're going to crucify him? Hold on, he's supposed to be the Messiah. I don't get it. Um, and so we see Mary there at the cross at the very end, just weeping. And you have to think as a parent, I don't know what she knew. You know, I don't know how much, um, I don't know how much Jesus told her. I don't know how much the Lord told her. But our human minds don't really grasp what it is that the Lord is doing. And so then he, he looks down and he says, you know, Mary, behold your son. And Tell uh, his disciple, behold your mother. And so he's like saying, he's going to take care of you now. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be okay. Um, and so none of this sort of happened the way that she had planned. And for a lot of us, this is us, that life just throws us a curveball left and right. Um, we don't know what's happening. It's not our plan. But her overall, through all of it, complete trust and yielding to the Lord's plan. So if we go back to my life, um, the thing that I had planned for myself would not look anything like this. It would not look like Kenny or my two girls. Um, and the coaching life, um, which is not incredibly different from the pastoral life. Um, I told Kenny this from the beginning. Coaching is the closest thing to what it's like to be in a pastor's family. Um, it's, it's alienating, it is isolating, it is um, very difficult. You bear a lot of people's burdens. Like there is a lot of similarity between those lives, but there's also the opportunity to speak into the lives of a lot of people. God has given us many students that we can share Christ with. Through FCA, we've had opportunities to share Christ with a lot of different people. I know you'll have a great FCA here. Um, I know Ashley does a, a great job with that. Um, we have dogs, though I don't like animals. We have three dogs. I don't have a picture of Jacket on here because I couldn't bring myself to put a picture of him up here. Um, but Scooby and Jolene, um, but this is our family. And Kenny is an Aggie, and I'm going to try to get you off my two so that you can watch the rest of that baseball game. Um, but Kenny is an Aggie, so that's a whole other world that I would not have known. None of this was my plan. But when I sit and I reflect and I look and I go, I can't see myself anywhere else but here. In Isaiah, go ahead the next one. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's desires for our lives are so much greater than anything that we could come up with on our own. I don't know what I would have done if I had gotten married right out of college. Um, in that time between uh, when I graduated college and, uh, and when I met Kenny, I got to nanny my oldest niece. Um, at, and so I got to build a relationship with her that now she's in college um, and now she calls me. Um, and we have, you know, I, I have 14 nieces and nephews on my side. Um, and Maddie and I have a bond that I don't really have with all of the others because I was with her for a really long time. And so, um, so we have a relationship. And this past year, she had a lot of medical issues. She's diabetic. And uh, she was angry with the fact that she's diabetic. And... Uh, why do I have to take insulin when other people do not have to? Um, why do I have to count my carbs? Why do I have to do all of these things? And so she took her patch off and she um, shut off her communications with her mom uh, so that her mom couldn't see what her blood sugars were. Well, she also couldn't see it because she took her patch off. Um, but she sent herself into ketoacidosis um, not too long ago. And she was in the hospital for a few days and and I called her and we talked for a long time. Um, and so she's back. <laughs> she's back and she's um, back in communication. There are now 16 different people, I think, that have access to her blood sugars <laughs> at all times. Um, and so, uh, but that bond, I wouldn't have that if I got married right out of college because I wouldn't have the opportunity to nanny her. 
Um, I, I got to go start a, a, a ministry at a camp. I had done camping ministry all throughout college. It's one of my favorite things. And um, I got to start this ministry at another camp that they still get to do now. I got to go to Colorado and be a church planning missionary. Um, I helped um, scout locations for a church on the on the east side of, uh, of Denver, Colorado. I was out basically at a truck stop for a good chunk of that year, um, just meeting people and going to the same diner over and over and over again and building relationships with the people that were there. Um, I got to go to India and, um, and, and do a, a teaching seminar um, for uh, for the church, oh, sorry, not the church, for a school um, that teaches about the love of the Lord um, with their people. But these are all things that that I had the freedom to do because I wasn't married at the time. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do those things um, if I had been married. Uh, if I'd gotten my way with, all, with several of these things, I can see how God has said, no, you can't do that because this is what I have for you. You, you can't do that because it, I know you really want that, but this is what I want for you. And over and over and over again, I have seen evidence in my life that the plan that God has was so much better than mine. You know, um, as I was continuing to age and continuing to be single, I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to have to marry a bald guy. <laughs> that was my thought. It's like, I'm going to have to marry a bald guy. Um, okay, I can do this. Um, and then I just, I met Kenny, and he was so much better than anything that I had envisioned for myself. I'm not a fancy girl. You may or may not recognize that, but I'm not a fancy girl. I don't fix myself up. Um, I'm not blonde. Um, I'm, like, I'm just not a stereotypical kind of college girl person that you guys envision. Um, and so I, I had already decided that this meant that I was going to get less than. But God said, no, I have so much more for you. And I don't know if you've seen Kenny, but he's a good looking guy. Um, and he's great. He's wonderful. He's so much more than anything that I could have imagined. I didn't want to parent girls because they are drama and they are um, too much because I can really enjoy growing up with <laughs> four girls in the family. There was drama all the time, so I was like, no, we need boys. Um, but I couldn't imagine not having Kinley and Karis. They're carbon copies of Kenny and I. Um, she looks like Kenny, but she acts like me. And Kinley looks like me and acts like Kenny. And Ken yes, that's true. Uh, acts like Kenny. And it's very surreal to look at somebody that looks exactly like you and then think, why are you not doing the things that I would do? I can't have a conversation with you. Go talk to your dad. Um, <laughs> and then I look at her, her, and she looks just like Kenny, but she thinks like me. And I'm like, yay, my kindred spirit. Um, but I couldn't imagine life without them. Uh, I couldn't imagine staying in the same school. I think about the very first school that I ever worked in, and, and I see what has happened in that school over time, and I'm just so thankful that I haven't been there for some of those things. And I think of the relationships that God has given me in each place. And and when we left when we left Bangs, we didn't know where we were going. Um, and Kenny and I knew we were leaving, but the girls didn't know that we were leaving. And, um, and we were coming home from... Uh, Ricky and Debbie's, and, I, and uh, we had decided that you know we needed to tell the girls that, that we were moving. And so, um, you know, I, I use quotes all the time, like we just happen to do this because the more I the more I see that, I know we say that a lot in society, but the Lord is directing that. Uh, we just happen to have started studying Abraham with our uh, we were teaching college um, the college class at the time. So we started, just happened to teach uh, Abraham and how God tells Abraham to go and he'll show him where he's supposed to go. And Abraham goes, okay. And so he goes and he just goes. And um, so we were telling the girls this and we we're like, you know, when you're using the story of Abraham, we we're like, God has told us we're leaving things. And we don't know where we're going. And um, can, you, can you tell us why? Why that could be kind of scary. And Kara said, because um, what if he tells you to go to a desert? Okay, and we're just thinking, you know, in school, you get random answers all the time, and you're constantly thinking, how can I spin this back to what we're actually talking about? Um, and so I'm like, I have no idea how to spin desert talk back to where we're going. So 
we were just like, okay, thanks, good one. Um, and we keep going, and then Karis stops and she goes, but wait, if you're in the desert, you need water. So where are you gonna find water? But if God tells you to go to the desert, he's gonna give you the water that you need. And Kenny and I just kind of stopped and we were just kind of quiet. And he was driving and it was dark. And he goes, leave it to our youngest child to tell our hearts what we needed to hear. It doesn't matter where he's going to take us, God's going to provide for us. So even if it's a terrible place, because at the time we thought we might have to go to Muleshoe. <laughs> and I was like, no, not Muleshoe. Um, but that was our thought process. And I remember thinking, where's the closest Walmart? Where's the, okay, I have to go to New Mexico for things? Okay. Um, and I just remember just being overwhelmed with all of these things. And then from the mouth of our youngest child is, the Lord is going to provide for you no matter where he takes you. If he's taking you there, he's going to provide for you. And um, and so that was just evidence for us that the, that the God of the universe, Mega, is involved with the God of your life. Um, I know that sometimes we think that he doesn't really care about us as intimately as that, but he does. And he has plans for you. You know, we hear that verse all the time, especially at graduation time, for I know the plans I have for you to put as the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And he's speaking to Israel in that time, um, but the same is true for us, right? The Lord has a plan for you. We see that if we go back to our verse here that's on our chest, Ephesians 2.10, um, because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has designed for us, that he has put in place beforehand so that we would walk in him. So God has a plan for you. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about, after we have lunch, we're going to talk about how do we know what that plan is and how do we walk in that plan. Um, but where you are right now may not be where you thought you would be. Um, you may be in the middle of something and you're like, what I'm doing. Um, you may be a planner. If we go back to our plan to revisit it, go to the next one. Um, there are people who read instructions versus people who don't. Um, I don't read instructions, but I need a big picture. Kenny doesn't need a big picture. He needs instructions. Um, and so if we take that and we apply it to life, what we tell our youth all the time is that the Bible is like an instruction manual. If God is the author and designer of the world and of us, then wouldn't he know how it should operate? Wouldn't he know the best way to have a marriage? Wouldn't he know the best way to parent your child? Wouldn't he know the best way to interact with a lost and dying world? Wouldn't he know the best way to do business? Wouldn't he know the best way to do all of those things? So why wouldn't we read his instruction manual? A lot of times we want that picture then. Just tell me what it's going to look like. But he wants us to trust him in the here and now as we walk through that. So for somebody like me, that I don't get a big picture, I get to just trust me and follow me. That's hard for me. Kenny is much better at that because he is an instruction person. He just wants to know what I need to do right now. It'll take care of itself, what I need to do right now. So I don't know what kind of a person you are. I don't know um, if you need a big picture or if you like the instructions, but... Regardless, if you are an instruction person, but then you neglect to read the instructions, then it does you no good. So you have an instruction manual that's laid out for you, but take the time to read it. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now, and we thank you for um, this time, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, Lord, and see examples of people um, whose lives perhaps didn't go the way that they thought that they would. Lord, we... We see that your plans, your thoughts, your ways are so much higher and uh, greater than anything that we could come up with on our own. But Lord, so often we try to uh, take over the, the control and plan and guide our own lives. And Lord, we mess it up every single time. So Lord, I ask that you would help us to have faith and trust and to depend on you and let you unfold our lives for us. Lord, we, uh, we ask that you be with us as we go through this discussion time, Lord, that you would, um, that you would give us um, fellowship with one another, that you would help us to encourage one another, that you would help us to see that we're not the only ones that go through these things, Lord, but that 
our, our shared experiences can help us and encourage us to continue to lean into you, to press into you. Lord, that when we see victories and we share those with one another, that you would help us to be encouraged to continue pursuing you, even when things don't go the way that we think they should, even when things are tough. Lord, this life was never promised to be easy, but it was always promised that you would be with us through it. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us to trust you. We love you and pray all these things in your son's name. Okay, so I'm a little, I'm a um, so your small group discussion. Uh, so get in your little groups, and then your discussion questions are in your book. And I did make a mistake in your book, so don't read ahead to discussion question three because they're the same as discussion questions two. I forgot to change it. So, but I have them for you, so don't don't stress about that. So if you'll get in your little groups, and then we'll have an activity a little later. <laughs> Go tell S Pops if you need to turn that on.
he'll do it, but you need to tell him that it needs to be done. He gets that from you? Okay. Um, and, so, uh, and so sometimes we need to be proactive in those things, that we need to say, okay, this is, this is something that I can do. And a lot of times as you just begin doing something, then it begins to open up other doors. When I was a kid, um, uh, well, actually, I'll use them. We were sitting there one day, one Sunday morning, we had gotten there early, and they were kind of stressing out in the in the nursery because they had several people call and say that they couldn't they couldn't come. And so, um, Kimley, our oldest girl, she comes over and she said, "Mom, Miss Courtney's over there, and she's really kind of stressed because she doesn't have enough people in the nursery. Can I help in the nursery?" And I said, well, "I don't, I don't know, I don't know if you're old enough, like." I, I don't know kind of how that works. You haven't done the training, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so, um, and she goes, I don't understand. They need help. I can help. So I go help. And I go, you're right, let's go. So we go in there and I said, hey, Courtney, here's the deal. I understand, not Courtney, Alyssa. I said, hey, Alyssa, um, I, I understand that y'all are shorthanded. My daughter would really like to help. And she goes, I'll take her. And so, um, and Karis goes, well, I want to help. And so she stayed too. And so they had two people. And then after that, uh, after church that Sunday, um, Alyssa came back and she said, I need them to do the training because we're putting them on rotation. And um, so that began with seeing a need and going, well, that's something I can do. Even if it's not something that people want to do, you see a need that needs to be filled fill it, and it begins to open doors for you to serve in other areas. For me, that was helping at VBS. They didn't have enough people to teach. And so when I was in junior high, um, they were short a teacher for the, um, the, the five-year-old class, and I said, I can teach that. I mean, that's fine. And they were like, well, but you're in junior high. I go, okay, they're five. Like, I'm older, it's gonna be okay. And so, because there were a lot of ladies that didn't mind helping, but they didn't want to teach. And so, um, so my assistant teacher um, was 60, 65. And, um, and they were like, so she's teaching. I was like, no, it's me. It's, it's going to be okay. And, uh, and it was. It was wonderful. It was great. And, and my uh, co-teacher encouraged me so much. But that began this path of, I can study God's word and I can share God's word with other people. And so it began to open doors. So if you're not using your gift, find a way to do it. Find a way to get involved. Um, so go ahead and go to the Oh yeah. I don't have that one right here. Um, so it says in, in Romans 12, 6, it says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. So he didn't give you a gift for you just to sit on it, but your job is to exercise that gift, um, to use it. And you all have different gifts for a purpose because you all have different jobs, different roles within the body. In 1 Peter 4.10, and this one I kind of split up into these two different things. 1 Peter 4.10 says, uh, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. <clears throat> There are things within our church that cannot be done. They cannot get done unless we each do our part, unless we each do our role, right? And so some people have, have a gift of giving. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be money, um, but giving of time, giving of things, giving of, like, just give. Like, do what you can. Um, I, when I was in high school, um, so I'm not the fastest person in the world. Um, I'm pretty slow, but I'm smart. And so, um, like school-wise. And so, um, so my coach, he, he gave backhanded compliments all the time. Um, and so he would say, um, who's the slowest person on this team? So that everybody would say me. Um, and he would say, but she has more steals than you. How is that possible? Because she knows where it's going because she studies it and she sees it and she gets where it's supposed to, where it's going to be before dummies have figured it out. Um, he wasn't the nicest person. Um, but so he was so he was saying you each have a role um, and her role is to see the floor and to communicate that. That was my job. 
if I ever tried to operate outside of my role, I got pulled. Okay, this was, I had this one game, I would, my rules were, you may not dribble, okay, yes sir. Um, you do not shoot three pointers because you're terrible at them, yes sir. Um, so I'm like, so what is my role? And he was like, your role is to know the play that's happening, to communicate with others where they need to be, okay, okay. Set screens, I love that, because that meant that I could floor somebody. Um, and then take fouls for somebody else. It was like, okay, I can do these things. So this one game, I was really feeling it. Um, and I stole the ball from the girl. She was just, she was just taunting me, just like standing there, like, like I know you're slow. And I was just getting angry inside. So I stole the ball. And I was like, oh, look, I'm going. And so I went and I, and I shot a layup. And I was like, yeah. And so then I, I go to turn and go around. And I'm thinking to myself, she's going to throw it to this girl. So I just turned around, stole the ball, shot made it again. So now I scored four points in like three seconds. And I was like, and so I'm going down the floor, steal the ball again. At this point, people are chanting, because I went by Rachel's school, and I was like, oh yeah, here we go. So I get out to the three-point line, and I'm like, give me the ball. This is my, this is my moment. And, um, and so I get the ball, and my coach yells, don't do it. And I was like, I'm going to do it. So I shoot. <laughs> He gets somebody and sends them to the sub table, right? Um, so I knew, like, I'm, I'm coming out of the game. It goes in, and I I ran back by, and I'm like, no, don't make eye contact. Like, don't make eye contact. And I get my Brian, he brings her back, he goes, you got lucky. And I was like, <laughs> he goes, you better, you better chill it out. I was like, yes, sir. And so know your role. Don't operate outside of your role. Because most of the times, that only happened once. Most of the times, if I tried to dribble, my left hand doesn't work very well, and so I would turn the ball over. If I tried to shoot a three-pointer, it's either going way over or it is under every single time. I don't even draw iron um, just because my depth perception is terrible. Like, but if I do my job, we work better as a team. Same thing within the body. Sometimes if we try to do something that we're not designed to do, things are going to go awry. I don't need to try to do somebody else's job. That's their job. That's what God has designed for them to walk in. I need to do the things that I am designed to walk in. The next thing we have to remember is we have to remember our purpose. So what is our purpose? The purpose in all of this, if we go to the, sec the verse right after that, in 1 Peter 4, we just read in verse 10, he said, and I'll recap verse 10, he says, each one received a special gift to employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then here he says, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the purpose of us employing these spiritual gifts is to bring honor and glory to the Lord, not for ourselves. <coughs> If our whole goal is to get attention and, and applause and adoration for these things, then, then that's it. Like, that's, that's that stuff that gets burned up, you know, that we talked about earlier. Um, we're building on this foundation, and when we build things for ourselves, those things burn up. They have no lasting effect. But when we do things for the honor and the glory of the Lord, those are the things that are lasting. Matthew 5.16, he says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So that's what we are supposed to be doing all of this for. It's to point people to the Lord. So if you're doing things and hoping that that, that attention, that glory comes to you, then that's wrong. We can spend a lot of time doing good things for the wrong reason. Um, but when we are doing things for the honor and for the glory of the Lord, pointing people to Him, and not expecting that adoration and things for us, those are the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, so if we, if we reflect on, go ahead. <coughs> reflect on the things that we've talked about this weekend. So this this poem, um, again, I like I like words. I like I put this on our shirt because. 
when I look at myself in the mirror and I see this, or when somebody says, what's your shirt say? It's going to remind me that I am his workmanship. And not just that I'm his workmanship, but that means something. Um, it means that, that I have a job to do. It means that I need to get busy serving. It means that I need to be living my life in such a way, employing the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit is developing within us, producing those spiritual fruits so that it points others to the Lord, so that they begin to glorify Him, so that they see that that is something that I want. In the, the devotional that we read this morning, um, when I was talking about the different foods and stuff, and, and Dad just saying, you don't know what you're missing. That's what, when you live your life, that's what you're telling the world. You don't know what you're missing. If you will taste and see that the Lord is good, He's so much better than anything that the world has to offer. All these things that may look pretty and flashy and all of those things, they don't last. They're traps. They lead toward destruction. But the Lord, He is good. The Lord satisfies. The Lord is developing within you a masterpiece so that you can serve one another and honor and glorify the Lord. So um, in the book of Esther, um, so Esther, <clears throat> Esther is a Jewish woman and um, she's one of the ones that's brought to, uh, to the king because Vashti has made him mad and uh, so he says, you're not queen anymore, go away. And so he's looking for another lady. And so Esther is one of the is one of the ones that is brought in, and he's like, "Oh, I like that one." And so Esther becomes queen. <coughs> and during this time, Haman Haman is not a big fan of the Jews, and so he comes uh, comes up with a plan to get rid of them. And Mordecai, who is Esther's uncle, um, he's talking to Esther about this, and he's telling her, um, "You need to go and." talk to the king about this. We need to preserve um, the Israelite people. And Esther's nervous. You know, Esther's, she's concerned. Um, and she kind of has this this pause, you know, where you could kind of, if, if it were me, I began thinking to myself, how can I fix this? Um, how can I fix this for me um, and make this, make this okay? Because sometimes my initial thought process is a selfish one, right? So I'm going to preserve myself. And so Mordecai and Esther are sending their people going back and forth between them carrying messages. And um, so then we have this, this, um, this little piece right here. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 13, Mordecai says, Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have attained, you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And I love this because it tells us a couple of things. Um, so it tells us, one, that God's plan is not going to be thwarted. Right? God, God can deliver his people. Okay? He has designed Esther for this. He has designed this work for her, and he has designed her to go through with this work. But he says, if you don't do this, he says, uh, deliver, relief and deliverance will arise from another place. So whether or not you do something does not determine whether or not God's plan is going to happen. He's going to do what he's going to do. Um, but he says, who knows whether you have not attained loyalty for such a time as this. Now she may be thinking to herself, this is like the, the prince in me. I don't know if you saw that wonderful wonderful movie where she suddenly becomes royalty um, so that's kind of where Esther is like we're said royalty it may not have been all that the romantic movies make it out to be um, but that's where she finds herself and he says what if this is the reason what if this is the masterpiece that God has been working in your life so that in this moment you can be the delivering piece for the Jewish people he says but if you don't do it somebody else will the beauty of it is, when you do that, you receive the blessing of being a part of what God has. So service, in and of itself, helps us. Yes, it helps other people, but if you've ever taken the opportunity to serve, it blesses your heart 
so much. And so people are missing out on the blessing of joining God in what he is already doing. God's, God's job, God's purposes, God's plan is going to come to fruition. You get to choose whether or not you're going to be a part of it. And being a part of it is where all of that blessing is. That's where the peace is. That's where the joy is. And being a part of it is when you begin to abide in him, spending time in the word, spending time in prayer, spending time fellowshipping with one another, that the Holy Spirit begins to develop these fruits of the spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things begin to be cultivated within your life. And those are all things that the world needs. Those things do not exist naturally within the world. You can look around and see that, right? That we're, we're seriously lacking in love and joy, and peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I think I missed one. Goodness, thank you. <clears throat> but the world is lacking those things. We have those things. Those are the things that we're supposed to be holding out, saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. These are the things that you're pursuing in every other thing. But if you'll just come to the Lord, you will see these things. You will have these things. You will be able to share these things with others. You will be able to join him in his work where he is. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now and we just thank you. We thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord, just to spend time looking in your word. Lord, we <clears throat> thank you that you are developing us into people who can serve you, Lord. And we, we thank you that you are designing things uh, for us to do, Lord. There are so many things that are competing for our attention um, in today's world. Things that inherently are, are not bad, necessarily. But Lord, when we elevate them above you, they become bad. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to realign our priorities, Lord, that you would help us to um, arrange our lives in such a way that you are our priority, that you are the one that we seek first, that you are the one that leads us and guides us. You are the one that we turn to no matter what, and then let all those other things fall in line. Lord, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you that you are patient with us. Goodness, I would have given up on myself a long time ago, but you have not ever forgotten, given up on me, Lord, and I, and I thank you for that. Lord, I ask that you would um, be with us as we go from here. Lord, help us to know how we're to apply these things to our lives. Lord, for those of us who, are, who don't really know what our gifts are, I ask that you reveal them to us. Lord, for those of us who are not actively serving, Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to find ways to serve, to get involved. For those of us who have neglected time spent in your word, I ask that you would give us a desire to be in your word. For those of us who have given up on fellowshipping with others, I ask that you would uh, remind us of the importance of that. Lord, help us to hold one another accountable, even if that means it hurts us to do so. Even if it reminds us of the things that we need to fix in our own life. Lord, those things are necessary. Lord, I ask that you would help us to, to pray. Lord, that you would help us to communicate with you. Lord, even though you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know all of those things, you love to hear from us. And then, Lord, help us to sit patiently and quietly and listen for you. Lord, help us to prioritize our relationship with you so that we can love the world around us the way that you love us. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for the way that you love us and take care of us. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat>
ask that you would help that to be the cry of our heart, Lord, that we would surrender all to you, Lord, that we would surrender our plans, that we would surrender our futures, that we would surrender our desires, Lord, to what you have for us. Lord, we uh, ask that you be with us as we go into our discussion time, Lord, that you would um, that you would uh, help us to encourage one another, and that you would just help us to um, take the things that we've learned and apply to our lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, I'm glad you came back. I was, you know, that's my first year as a physical. Came back, so yeah. We'll, uh, we'll do this and then we'll do some more girl friends. You want to go ahead and do the girl friends? Okay, go ahead. So we'll go ahead and draw two names. She's been itching to do this. So we'll go ahead and draw two names.
there's a couple different places in the in the Bible where it talks about Christ being our firm foundation. And in Matthew chapter seven, verses twenty four through twenty seven, I think it is. Um, he talks about the two the two foundations: the man who builds on the rock and the man who builds on the sand. And, and when the rains come and the winds blow, the one that's on the firm foundation is going to stand, and the one that's on the sand is just going to completely be demolished. And I remember this, you know, as a kid, we would go to the beach. Um, I hate the beach, but our family went to the beach every single summer because my, both my parents are from Corpus Christi and uh, Corday. And so that's where we just went every year for a week, and we would camp on the beach and attend. Um, there were seven of us in one tent full of sand. And it was just disgusting. But um, we would go, and, and so I didn't want to get in the water or anything like that. So I would either sit in the car uh, with the back up, and I would sit there, um, or I would build because I like building. And so I hated it because I would build, and I would think that I was out of the way of the water, but it would always come, and then it would just destroy everything, everything that I'd worked so hard for. And so then I would move to another location. I'm scouting, and I'm like, okay, this is a good spot. And it wasn't until I would completely move away with it and didn't have any sand to build with. But I'd completely move away if I was if I was on something solid, then it was gonna withstand. Um, and so we have this firm foundation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and he's saying, you know, I laid a foundation. There's some there's some issues going on in the church in Corinth, and they're kind of arguing and complaining and um, saying, Well, I follow this guy, I like this guy better, and all this stuff, and, and Paul's like, enough. We all have different jobs. You know, some plant the seed, some water the seed, some do all of these things. It doesn't matter. We're not supposed to follow a man. We're supposed to follow the Lord. We're supposed to follow Jesus. And that's the thing that's really important. And he says, you know, I've laid a foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And you can't lay another foundation that's worth anything other than Jesus Christ. And he said, each one of you is now building on that foundation. And you build on that foundation through the things that you do, you, you know, your works. And so he says, you can build on that with gold, silver, precious stones. Those are all really, really good things. He says, you can build on it with wood, hay, and straw. And if you have ever heard the story of the three little pigs, this is not a good situation. Because the wood, the hay, and the straw, that stuff all gets demolished and destroyed. But that gold, silver, precious stones, that's the Lord working through you. And those are the things that are going to stand the test of time. And so... Um, so my challenge to you is to think about what is it that you're building on this foundation that has been laid in your life. As a believer, you have this foundation of Christ. And then the rest of your life, as we are walking through these works um, that the Lord has designed for us, we're building on that foundation. Sometimes we try to do those things in our own power. That's that wood, hay, straw stuff. Um, we try to do things for our own glory. Wood, hay, straw, that stuff's going to be destroyed. But when we allow God to lead us, and guys, he gives us the best materials and those things are the things that last. Those are the things that have eternal, eternal existence. And so that's what this means.
And then life began to happen. And y'all, none of these things happened. Um, go ahead and do the first one. So I graduated college without ever going on a date. I'm like, I'm already behind. Um, so this is not this is not happening. Like all those guys that were there, I was like, I can't marry any of these people. Why would I go on a date with them? Um, one guy kind of tricked me into going on a date, but I was not aware that it was, and so I don't count that one. Um, but that's a weird story. Um, so <laughs> that's for another time. Um, and so. So I graduated college without going on a date. And then I was single forever. You guys, I was single for life. Um, not really, but I was single until I was 30. And it was just one of those things that was really difficult um, for me. In, in my family, um, my mom, mom was engaged at 16, um, and then dad left to uh, for Vietnam, and then he came back, and then they got married. So she was married young. My oldest sister got married the weekend after she graduated college. My second sister got married um, the year before she graduated college. My sister younger than me, the four years younger than me sister, she got married uh, three years before I did. Um, and then my youngest sister had been dating this guy forever, and we were like, and I was like, I will not be the last one because she's eight years younger than I am. And I was like, this is not happening. Um, and I remember one Thanksgiving, Kenny and I had just started dating, and we're and we're my dad. I love my dad, um, but he's not always aware socially of things. Um, and so my now brother-in-law Sam had asked my dad for permission to to marry Summer, that my youngest sister. And so he was like, yes. And so dad didn't really understand. He thought that they had already gotten engaged. So he comes back to the house and he's like, they're engaged. Somebody didn't know. Nobody else knew. And it was just like this weird, awkward silence. And I remember everybody just fading into the back. You've seen that meme of Homer Simpson going back into um, the shrub. That was everybody. We were just like, slowly walk away. And uh, so I called Kenny and I was like, oh man, that just messed up. Um, and so, it's just kind of funny, but that helped me because then Sam got nervous and he put it off for a year. So yay! So then I got married before summer. Okay, so um, so I met Kenny at the age of 30, and so I had been teaching for a while before this happened, and I had two girls in my class, um, Heidi and Carly. And I don't know if y'all watch um, animated films, but if you've ever seen Monsters Incorporated, they have those two janitors, right? And they're like, you're so awesome. That was Heidi and Carly. Like, they went everywhere together. They were just goofy. They were just wonderful, fun children. And I love them dearly. Um, but they had decided that they were going to find someone for me to marry. And I was like, I don't need that. Thank you. Um, and so they would come into my class. I had a, 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 it, was a it was a tax study class back when you took the tax test. Um, and so we would go and do our stuff, but they would get in there early and they would draw all over my board. And they drew this guy, his name was Ben Matthews. That was the guy that they had designed for me. Ben Matthews, and they would draw all these pictures of, this is what he's going through to get to you right now. And he was walking through like a pool of snakes and all this stuff. They're like, he's coming and all this stuff. And, and I just remember them saying, you know, you need to start being you know, like, going to the bar so you can meet somebody. And I go, okay. If I don't want my husband to go to the bars, then why would I go meet a guy at the bar? Because then he's just going to continue going to the bars all the time. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. And they're like, okay, then you got to go to a different church. Because the church that you're at doesn't have anybody single in it. And I said, okay, so let's think about this for just a second. If I'm going to church to meet a man, then I'm not going to church for the right reasons. And I said, so uh, I need you to understand understand that my God is bigger than that. That if God wants me to meet somebody, he can bring him into my hallway, into my front door to meet me. Like, that's what he can do. And they're like, okay, you're going to be single forever. And so so that, that summer comes, and, and as a single person, I didn't have any summer plans. Like, there wasn't anything that I did other than summer school. I taught that because, hey, the single lady can do that. Um, and so so I, here I am. I would keep my schedule because I'm a schedule person. I, and you may not know that looking at me um, through my daily life, but I am a schedule person. I like to keep routines. And so I would get up, get ready, take a shower. But in the summer, I would look like a super scrub. Um, and so like 
had these gross cargo shorts on. My hair was still really wet and just really kind of gross. And it was usually the office and me. And that was all that was there during the summer. And so I go in to my office, uh, go into the office, and then they're like, hey, hey, hey. And then I go to my room. And my room was right catty corner to the office. And as I'm walking, I hear um, Kelsey Perkins. And I was like, who's in here? Who's in the darkness? And out of the darkness, as I'm going into my classroom door, comes our AD. His name was um, uh, Richie. So Coach Richie comes, and he goes, I want you to meet somebody. And he has Kenny with him. And I just, I was like, I look like trash. Like, this is awful. Like, and a little backstory: we lost a lot of coaches the year before. And before we left for the summer, I took an index card to Coach Richie, and I said, I have a list of things that you need to, that I think would make a wonderful coach for you. And it was my list of things that I wanted to in somebody to marry. And so, um, so I gave him that and I said, I have a list of things that I think would make a wonderful coach. And so I just want you to, to have this, you know, while you're going through your interviews and all this stuff. So anyways, so he comes and he's like, I'd like you to meet Kenny Prescott. And I was like, ah, oh, hi, okay. Um, and so he's, Kenny is dressed, you know, for an interview. And I am dressed for going to an, a classroom full of nobody and I was going to watch Chuck or something like that, Alias actually, I think what I was going to watch on my big screen in my classroom by myself. Um, and so I did not look right. So he goes and he goes to the back and I'm doing my work. And so I go into the office and, um, and my, uh, my principal, he was talking to me and he was like, have you met the new guy? And I was like, oh, we hired him. He was like, well, I think we're going to. Okay, so then the AD comes in, and he goes, um, "What? so what do you think? And you have to understand, the AD, Kenny will tell you this, he thought he was um, a hobo um, when he came in, because he was wearing cargo shorts, and he had decided he was not shaving for the summer, and so he had this, like, grossness happening all over, and I was like, why can't you look like this? And he goes, are you kidding me? I bring a guy in who hits every single one of those things on that list that you gave me, and all you want to talk about is how I haven't shaved this summer, and I go, oh, well, nice job on him, um, but still. So then he and the principal conspired to make me Kenny's mentor teacher so that I have to talk to him um, every week and all of this stuff. So, so Kenny and I began dating, um, but I was very, from the beginning, I was like, this is not going to be a school romance. We're not talking about this with students. They don't even know that we're dating because I'm not going to be a topic of conversation in this hallway. Our principal knew, and then I had to let the uh, Regent Center know because I was his mentor. I was like, I don't know if this is frowned upon. Um, and so that, I remember Heidi and Carly coming to my classroom the next year, and they had been talking about it. They were like, you should date this guy. Like, you should date this guy. And I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And so they came one day. Um, it was right before Christmas, and they were like, Ms. Perkins, we think he's dating somebody. And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, he's dating somebody. I was like, you know. And they're like, oh, because somebody was trying to fix him up with somebody. And he was like, no, I'm okay. I'm, you know, I'm kind of seeing somebody. So I go, find out who it is. Like, find out who this is. And they're like, okay. And so, so they go away. We go to Christmas break, and we had gone to Olive Garden to eat. <laughs> and this girl comes over, one of our students, and we were sitting there. So. We made it all the way through Christmas. And she comes over and she just puts her hand on, on our table and she looks at she goes, what's going on here? <laughs> and I said, this is what people call dinner. Um, sometimes people come together and they eat food and then they talk and this is, that's what this is called. Seems like you know what this is because you're also here at Olive Garden. And she goes, okay. <laughs> Okay, and then she just turns and walks away. And I said, so the town knows now, and they did. By the, I mean, the next moment, like everyone, everyone knew. And so Heidi and Carly come back that right after Christmas, they came back and they said, it was you. And I said, yeah, it was me. And they go, hold on. Last year, you said, that if God wanted you to meet somebody, he could bring him into this hallway to your door. He's been Matthews, and he did what you said God could do. I said, absolutely he did. And they're like, 
that is so awesome. And I was like, and you just said what they say on Monsters Inc. That is so awesome. That's so awesome. I was like, this is great because it allowed them to see. So why was I single for so long? Perhaps for Heidi and Carly. Perhaps for that moment. So that was not my plan at all. Um, so then, you know, we wanted to get married and then kind of be us for a little bit. That was not God's plan. God wanted me to have two girls really quickly um, instead of my two boys and one girl because I've always considered myself to be a boy mom. Turns out I'm a girl mom. No, maybe not the best one. I don't know how to do hair or makeup or really anything. So, but they're doing okay. They're, they're surviving. Um, but God does, he was like, nope, you're going to have two girls really quickly. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then, uh, so in my head, who I married was going to be a pastor. And so we were going to stay in the same place forever because my dad was a pastor. Kenny was not. Kenny was a coach. And so um, I lived the coaching life, which means I do not get to stay in the same school forever until I retire. Um, so we have moved because that's the coaching life. And then now I just feel old. I haven't gotten to retire yet. I just feel old. Like every day I do something else. Yesterday I went to the grocery store. Um, I was all by myself. It was glorious. Um, and so I'm going through with all of my groceries and I get all the way to the front. I'm chatting with the lady behind me. Um, she was really nice. And the guy, the lady in front of us um, was like complaining about everything and it was taking a really long time for her. And so I was just like sitting there and I was like, it's okay. And so we get to the, the very front, and I reach for my purse, and I go, so I don't have my purse, so I'm gonna take everything now off of the conveyor belt, and so I put it all back in my basket, and I'm like, can I put this somewhere until I go get my purse? And they're like, yeah, so I called Kenny on the way out, I was like, I'm officially old, got all the way to the front, was about to check out, didn't have my purse. He was like, where is it? I go, not real sure. So we'll find it and then I'll come back. So I do things all the time and so it makes me just feel really old. But my life did not turn out any way that I thought it would. None of my plans came to fruition. And I've been planning that since the very beginning. The only thing that actually got my way was the wedding. Um, because by that time I'd already been in 895 weddings because I got to watch every single one of my roommates get married. I got to watch all of my sisters, except for Summer, get married. Um, and so I already knew what I wanted and what I didn't want. And so it was really pretty fantastic. I didn't have to wear shoes at my wedding. Um, and Mom was like, oh, you need to wear shoes. Mom said, Mom actually said, what if your mother-in-law wants you to wear shoes? And I said, well, my mother-in-law's already married. So she got to have her wedding, so I don't have to wear shoes for mine. And so um, it was glorious. None of us had to wear shoes. And, and then Kenny was like, well, I don't want to wear a suit. I go, okay. So we're like linen pants and a linen shirt. He was like, okay. So when I told my dad, who, who did our wedding, I said, um, we have linen pants and a linen shirt. He goes, I don't have to wear a monkey suit. And I said, no. He goes, I don't have to wear a suit. And I said, no. And he was like, yes. And so it was glorious. So I got to do what I wanted for my wedding. I had all of my music lined out, everything because music is important to me. Um, so that was pretty much the only thing that I got the way I wanted, but everything else changed. I was not in control of those things. At last, at a James, that was my, yes, it was, uh, it was wonderful. And I had it time and I was like, and you go. And the lady in the back was like, do you want me to do that? I was like, no, you'll mess it up. Uh, and go. And so I had it. I knew exactly when everyone needed to go. And, and that didn't stress me out at all. Um, so, so there are two types of people in the world. Um, we like to go to Ikea. Um, I love Ikea. I love walking through that store. I don't know if you've ever been. Have y'all been to an Ikea? No, it's glorious. Um, and so I just go in and I have all these ideas, but I look at the rooms and I'm like, I could never do this, but I want this one piece. And so we always get something and we take it home. And so we have two types of people. Um, Kenny is the kind of person that reads directions. So anytime we get something from Ikea, he's going to open it up, find the directions. He's going to read every single one. He's going to follow it every single one from the beginning. Um, and I... Throw the directions away um, because it's like I can do this. I can do this on my own. So those are the two types of people. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other people, but um, the directions people and then those who don't read directions. And so all I need is a bigger picture. That's it. 
It's kind of like puzzles. Um, every now and then I just want to show me what it looks like at the end, at the beginning, and then throw it away and then we'll do it. Um, I get these puzzles, these like wooden puzzles I like for my classroom. They all come with, with little directions that tell you the solution. Throw that sucker away um, because I'm going to figure it out. Like that's what I'm going to do. Um, but Kenny is not that person. He wants to know. So we build things all the time. So this um, over here, this he built this little um, picnic. You also have it, the little picnic table. Mm -hmm. Just stayed at the other place. Okay. So he built this, and he was like very much like, okay, I need this to be this long. Da, 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 da. And I was like, okay. Um, and then the thing on the right, that's the bunk bed that we built for the girls. And um, he was like, do you have a plan? I go, mm-hmm. What's in my head? It's okay. We'll just cut things and we'll put them together. It'll be great. And guess what? The bed's great. Um, so we can get things out of both of those. And so the two types of people. So um, so we're going to look at some people, uh, some biblical examples of women whose lives perhaps didn't go the way that they thought they would. Um, and we may um, identify with some of these women. Um, so I've got three different, oh, well, actually it's four, but uh, different women. So I'll kind of I'll kind of give you a summary of their, of their story as we go through this so that we can kind of see. So our first one we're going to talk about is Hannah. And you can find Hannah's story in uh, <clears throat> 1 Samuel uh, chapters 1 and 2. And so a little, just a, a little background on Hannah. Um, so there's this man named Elkanah, and he had two wives. Um, we won't get into the multiple wives thing, but he has two wives. He has Peninnah and Hannah. Okay. Now, Peninnah is a treat. Um, and Peninnah has kids, um, but Hannah is barren. Hannah cannot have kids. And so Peninnah is, um, she's really good at just letting Hannah know, I can have kids, you can. And she just continues to, to mess with her over and over. And she, and she just stresses her out. And Hannah is um, continually praying over and over. And so Elkanah would travel yearly to uh, to do their sacrifices in Shiloh and so he's going uh, every year because they're faithful and so he's going and Hannah and Penina go and and whenever they do their um, their meals he gives Penina hers but he gives Hannah a double portion because he loves her um, and, and Hannah is just sad and so Hannah is um, she's he's asking her like why are you sad and so she's telling him she's like I can't have kids. Like, that's this part of my plan. I want to have kids. And, and Elkanah says to her, aren't I better for you than ten sons? Like, I love you, um, and I uh, provide for you. I give you all of those things. But, you know, children were important in that society because they helped sustain life. They also carried on the family line. And, and so property and things like that would pass through the males. And so... So she's just sad, and so, you know, he's talking with her, and she just gets up from eating, and then she goes to um, to the temple, and you'll see, she she goes, and she's uh, praying, and in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, it says, she greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly, and so she's praying, and praying, and praying, she says, it says that she's praying in her heart, but her lips are moving, and uh, Eli, the priest, is there, and he comes over, and he he misjudges her initially, and he's like, woman, why are you drunk already? And she's like, what? I'm, not, I'm just, I'm sad. And so she just tells him, like, she lays it down, and she says, this is what I'm saying to the Lord. I don't understand it. You know, and, and we don't know exactly her heart, but I can imagine saying, if it were me, it'd be like, why does the get to have kids? But I don't, you know, we have, we have, um, I had um, I have four sisters, and um, two of them struggled greatly having kids. My eldest sister, um, I think she she miscarried three times, um, and I remember just thinking my second sister um, she had a baby before Ricky did, and and it was just one of those things that you could just kind of see it in Ricky's face. How come she can have kids? Um, but I can't. Um, and so when we got married, not me and her, but when Kenny and I got married, um, I remember I remember telling Kenny, like, if we want to have kids, we probably have to start trying to have kids because I don't know how long it could take. It took Ricky years. Um, 
But then the Lord said, ha ha, you're a fertile mortal. There you go, there's a kid. Um, and, so, uh, and so our lives were different. They, and so it didn't go the same way. And so she lays all this before the Lord. And, and then the, she, uh, sorry, Eli tells her, you know, go back, you know, the Lord hears you. And so she goes back home and, and she gets pregnant. And she goes home, and so then she she delivers the son, um, and uh, she delivers Samuel, and um, and she says, you know, because she's telling the Lord, if you let me have a kid, I'll commit it to you. And a lot of times we do this, right? We we make these deals with God, and um, and then when we get what we want, we we forget our deal. But Hannah didn't, and so she she says, um, Lord, I'll give him back to you, and he'll serve you. And so when we go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 again at the end um, this is some time has passed she's had Samuel she stays at home and, and weans him and then she brings him back to Eli and she says for this boy I prayed and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him so I've also dedicated him to the Lord and as long as he lives he is dedicated to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there so she takes him back to Shiloh and she leaves him with Eli as a young boy. And she's, you know, for, so this child that she's prayed for for years that Penin has been goading her over and over that she doesn't have kids. She finally has a kid and she goes, okay, Lord, thank you. He's yours. And we see what Samuel does throughout the rest of time. You know, Samuel um, becomes the priest that anoints David and he continues on in that. And the Lord continued to bless Hannah and uh, she has more children after that. And so... Um, when when we were first married, um, we had a, a, a coach that was Kitty's assistant. Her name was Jessica. And Jessica and Matt had been married for a very long time, and, and they could not have kids. Um, and so when we had Kinley, um, you could see it. And she would take every opportunity just to, she just cannot hold her. I was like, absolutely, you can. And so she would hold her in um, that year. Um, Jessica, she moved to, I think she stopped teaching also, and um, they moved to a different district. They were still really close, and and, um, and I just, I started coaching and again, and uh, and I just remember we were just thinking, what are we going to do with Kinley? Like, she's so tiny, and Jessica's like, I'll watch her, and so Jessica began to, to watch uh, Kinley, and um, there were just things that and she would take videos of her and send them to us and just the joy that they had um, watching Kinley and, and we got to share Kinley with her and um, I just remember them praying continually and then asking us to pray and we would pray and, and then um, we moved and, uh, and shortly after we moved they called and were pregnant and uh, it was like are you kidding? Like they've tried for seven years and, and then suddenly the Lord Says, okay, now it's time. Um, they just had their fourth, their fourth, I think, yes. Um, and it's been boom, 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 like they, yeah. It's been wonderful to see. Um, and so, what was her response? So, through this, I mean, she's greatly distressed, but a couple of things that we can see here from Hannah is she doesn't stop serving the Lord. She doesn't say, God, if you're not going to give me kids, then I'm done with you. If our plans don't align, then we're finished. Like, she doesn't do that. She continues to serve the Lord. Um, and then she continues to pray. That was her go-to response. She's praying. Um, and she shares her distress with the Lord. Yes, the Lord knows your heart. He knows what you need. He knows all of those things. But there's something about when you go to him with those requests. It shows that you trust him. That you know that he has the power to do the things to fix it. Now, I don't want us to get confused um, and think that if we do those things, then we get what we want. That's not necessarily the way that this works. But um, but sometimes God does choose to do that. There, are, there, We have no idea what his reasons are for his plan. But as we spend time with him and as we take our concerns to him and as we continue to serve him, we begin to see what he has designed for us. Um, our next story that we have... It's Naomi and Ruth, and this is throughout the book of Ruth. It's not a very long book. If you've ever um, read it, you know. And so at the very beginning, there was a famine in, uh, in the land, and so Elimelech uh, takes his wife, 
uh, Naomi and his two sons, Mahon, Mahlon and Kilion, and he takes them to Moab, okay, so that they can have food and different things like that. So they go to Moab, and while they're there, Mahlon and Kilion, they meet these Moabite women, and they marry them. Um, and so we have Ruth and then Orpah, not Oprah, which is what I thought her name was when I was growing up, but Orpah, which actually Oprah's original name was Orpah, but then they misspelled it somewhere along the way, so now she just goes by Oprah. It's really weird. But anyways, so he um, so meets these two women, they marry, and so they're a family. And then disaster strikes, and Elimelech dies. Um, and then Malon and Kilion die. And so now we have Ruth, and we and Ruth, Orpah, and then Naomi, and they've lost the men in their lives. Um, and so Naomi says, well, okay, I'm going back to my people, because she doesn't really have options at this point. Um, the way the society was set up, like men were sort of your lifeline. And so she's like, I don't have options at this point. So she says, all right, ladies, I'm going back home. Y'all stay here with your people. And, and initially, um, Ruth and Orpah are both like, no, 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 we're going to go back with you. And she goes, why? Like, I don't have anything. I don't have any other kids that, that can marry you. Even if I met somebody today and then got pregnant, are you really going to wait around 16 years for them to marry you? And I've got to have two so that I've got two daughters in law. And so Orpah goes, okay, fine. And then Orpah leaves. And then Ruth goes, no, nah, I'm going with you. And you see this, some people have this in their wedding game. This is where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And so Ruth saw something in Naomi. She saw the God that she had worshipped. And she says, no, that's what I want to be a part of. And so she follows. Um, she follows uh, Naomi home. And it <laughs>
His time and breath has brought me out. 
but that's kind of the picture that we have here is, is, is God knows how you're going to walk. He knows what you need to be supported in that walk. And so he's going to equip you with everything that you need to walk in the path that he has designed for you. And so that's going to be what we do. So then, so the first question, oh, so, no, go, go ahead. Okay, so we talked about being his craftsmanship. That was what we talked about in session one last time. We talked about what do we do when the plans don't really match up. Our plan is the one that needs to yield because his plan is the one that is greater. And so now we're going to talk about this last part, that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. So he, he's designing us for good works that he prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Okay, so that's the part that we're going to focus on in this last section. So how do we do that? So the first thing that we have to do is we have to get to know the master. Okay, you, that's how you know what... What he wants for you, right, is you have to know him. You have to know his heart. And the closer that you are to him, um, the easier that becomes. When I, when I taught, um, when I taught, when I um, worked in camping ministry, um, so I did that all throughout college, and I had these students that would come, and I worked with the high school students, and we did all the service around. So we, you know, did the trash, the dishes, the all those things, all the grunt work. That was what we did. And then... Um, Dennis and I, he was the other co-leader, we led Bible studies with him and did things like that while the other, while the camp was going on. Um, and so it was really funny because when the kids would come at the beginning uh, of their walk, um, I would say these things, I, I, I get into the habit of saying things over and over again, the kids thought they were funny at first, but at the end of the two-week walk, they were all saying the same things. Um, all of these um, things that they thought were weird and quirky, they were now doing them because they were spending time with me. Um, you can tell a lot with kids who they've been around um, by how they are acting in that moment, um, the things that they are saying, the attitude that they may be throwing. You can tell who they've been spending their time with. The same should be true for us. If we are spending time with the Lord, then that should be reflected to others. They should be able to look at us and go, there's something different about this person. They must have been spending time with the Lord because our, our speech should be different. Our actions, the way we treat other people, that should all be reflected. Because as you spend time with the Lord, you will begin to do things the way the Lord designed them to, to be done. And so, um, so how do we know him? So the first thing that we have to do is we have to study the Bible. We're going to talk about three, three ways that we can get to know him better. So the first one here we have in Romans 10, 17. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We have to know the word. Um, it's, it's really hard to know what you're supposed to do. Like you can, when you give kids a test, you can tell whether or not they've studied what you have given them, right? Because sometimes they're just making stuff up. And I was the queen of making stuff up in uh, in uh, English in college. Um, I had a professor one time, and she would ask a question. She would say, you know, um, so what does it mean in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight that the knight is green? And no one would answer. So then I would raise my hand, and she'd say, Cassie, and I go, I think it's really significant that the green represents the night, because that's a metaphor for something greater that we're supposed to see. And she'd go, exactly. And I was like, all I did was restate your sentence. Um, but, or your question, and so, so when we, we're not going to know how to answer these questions. We're not going to know how to how to embrace life or how to encounter life circumstances unless we read his instruction manual. We talked about that. Otherwise, we're just regurgitating something else that somebody told us, right? And so we need to be in the word reading those things. In Psalm chapter 1, I love Psalm chapter 1. It starts it out, and we see this progression at the very beginning. Um, and it says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So there's a progression, right? This is how sin works, right? Satan doesn't throw it out there and say, Here, this is destructive for you. He says, Look, it's not so bad. It's a shiny little fish in there. It's great. Follow it a little bit. And then he hooks you a little bit. And then before you know it, you're snared and you can't really do anything about it. We see this picture with Lot. Remember when Abram and Lot um, separate, it says the last part that we hear about Lot at that moment is it says Lot uh, pitched his tents towards Sodom. And that's all we hear until later when Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed. And he's no longer tent camping outside. He is now at the city gate which means it wasn't enough. 
So then he goes into town, and that's not enough. Now he's a city official within the town. And so we see this progression of sin, okay? So, so here the psalmist says, how blessed is the man who does not do those things, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. So this is the righteous man. So Psalm does this a lot. They'll, they'll do the, um, the foolish person and the wise person, or they'll do the, um, the adulterous person and the, and the faithful person. They do this contrast over and over and over again. So we see here this wicked person or the unrighteous person and then the righteous person. So in the same way that the unrighteous or the wicked person progresses into sin, when we spend time with the Lord, we, we begin to take root in what he has. When we meditate on it day and night, that means we're thinking about it, we're speaking about it, it's saturating our mind, it's saturating everything, and it begins to permeate. And it says then we will be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water. Um, when, I, when I worked at camp, it was always fascinating to me, like it would never rain the entire summer. Nothing is growing except by the water. And we would have all these trees and they would have this cool root system and they're like, Coming, it's like they're crawling into the water so that they can be there where they're receiving their nourishment. It says that's what you're like, and you're yielding your fruit in season. What is that fruit? It's the fruit of the Spirit, right? So those are the things that, this, that the Holy Spirit manifests within your life um, as a byproduct of Him being within you. And so He says whatever He does prospers. And then in Psalm 37, I like Psalm 37, um, in, uh, I, I used to Memorize this middle verse, Psalm 37, 4. Um, but beginning of verse 3, he says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. And I remember um, as a kid thinking to myself, um, on our, on our um, offering envelopes growing up, they had these check boxes, right? You would have to check if you um, read your Bible every day, if you brought your Bible to church, if you, like, I don't know why we had to check this stuff. But anyways, that's what, we, that's what we would do. And I kept thinking to myself as a kid, reading this verse, as long as I can check these boxes, then I'm going to get what I want. <laughs> like that was my thought process, right? Um, and I, and I kind of carried that thought process because then it becomes about what I do. Right? And so then now God's love is dependent on what I do. Um, and that's a very flawed way of thinking, right? And that's, that's what Paul is arguing against in that first part of Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. He's saying it's not your works, it's not what you can do, because you can never do enough, right? Um, but then as I got older and I began to read this, I, it's different. As we delight ourselves in the Lord, as we spend time with the Lord, as we spend time in his word, our desires change. Our desires become the desires that he has for us. Remember, we talked about those two plans, our plans that we have for our life and God's plans. As you get to know the master, his plans are revealed to you when you go, well, that's what I want. You know, if you had told, you know, if you had told, um, 13-year-old Kessie, you're going to have to wait until you're 30 um, to, to meet the guy that you're supposed to marry. I would have been like, that's not what I signed up for. Um, but as I spend time with the Lord, it becomes okay that I'm 27. It becomes okay that I'm 28. It becomes okay that I'm 29. It becomes okay because my desires are changing. My desires are for the Lord. And as those desires continue to grow, then he gives you the desires that you should be pursuing, which is really kind of cool. Um, the next one is fellowship. So fellowship is incredibly important. Um, for believers, it is, it is vitally important. Go ahead and go to that first one. Um, in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so there's a community that's here, right? There's a community, there's a fellowship. We have a responsibility to one another. And as we kind of walk through life together with one another, and as we encourage one another with the things that we are learning as we read scripture, um, then that begins to increase our fellowship. And fellowship is incredibly important. But our fellowship with one another is not the most important thing because we cannot do that unless we have our vertical fellowship um, first. And so uh, I love 
John. Uh, John writes kind of the way I think. Um, and so when he writes his gospel, and then first, second, and third John, they're very similar. They have similar um, uh, things that he talks about. And if you read that, you'll notice that John never calls himself John. Do you remember what he calls himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved, right? And so love is the thing that was incredibly important to him. It's the thing that stuck out to him. It's the thing that he recognized Jesus doing to him or for him that was so significant, right? And so, um, so he talks about this concept of love. And, and here in, in John chapter 15, this is Jesus speaking. And uh, in verses 4 and 5, these are the only parts that I'm going to talk about. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's amazing to me how, um, so I have a garden. I'm not a very good gardener. Um, I've had one successful garden and then three fledglings. Um, and then some that were just completely, it's like I didn't plant anything. Um, and so I would plant it and I would be like, and I'm good. And then I would go away and I wouldn't really take care of it. I wouldn't tend it. And then I'd get upset at the fact that I didn't have fruit. I didn't have my squash or my zucchini or my um, jalapenos or my or my anything, and it's like, what did I expect? If I'm not going to be spending time taking care of it, and nurturing it, and all of those things, then I can't expect fruit. And I believe as, as Christians, a lot of times we're like that. We think, why why aren't I producing fruit? Why is it? But we're neglecting our our being abiding in Christ. Right? We, we are neglecting our fellowship with the Lord. Fellowship is incredibly important. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So unless we're tapped into the mind, unless we're tapped into our source, then we can't expect anything else to happen. Like, we're, we're going to be a fledgling garden that's not yielding its fruit. Um, remember, we go back to our psalm, and it says, we'll be like a tree that's planted by the by the, by the water, and it will yield its fruit in season. So as we're spending time in the Word, as we're spending time with one another as believers, as we are encouraging one another, then that fruit begins to produce within our lives. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the, the day drawing near. So we have a responsibility within the body. And there's accountability that it's talking about here, right? That's part of fellowship, is our accountability to one another, and to hoping we're holding one another accountable. Now, I don't know about you, but accountability is kind of a funny thing. <clears throat> Um, I, I have I have a real hard time not drinking Dr. Pepper's, okay? I love Dr. Pepper. Um, when I was in high school, I was, um, the teacher that was in charge of the Dr. Pepper machine didn't want to be in charge of it anymore. And so she said, I will give you the key, and you can have a Dr. Pepper whenever you want, as long as you fill it, fix it when it's broken, count the money for the deposit, and turn it into the office. And I said, do you know what you're saying? And she said, I think so. I said, I don't think so, but I'll take that deal. So I did. So for, for three years, I ran the Dr. Pepper machine in our high school, and I drank 10 Dr. Peppers a day. I would get one when I got to school. I'd get one between every class period. I would get one at the beginning of lunch. I would get one at the end of lunch, and I would get one before I left for the day. And then I tutored people, and then um, they would give me Dr. Peppers when I got there. So I was like... Uh, it was not good for my health. Um, so, um, where am I going with this? Oh yes, accountability. So, um, so I would, so I have a real hard time. So I, I, I set that up for myself, which made it really hard for me to not drink Dr. Pepper's when I got older, right? And so this is something we work with our girls. We don't want them to drink sodas. And so I tell them now, they're like, well, how come you had Dr. Pepper? And I'm like, okay, I understand. This is what I'm trying to not have happen for you. So I'm trying to not let you be addicted to them like I was. So um, I have had one Dr. Pepper in since April 1st. I'm super excited about this. And I've been praying about it because I'm like, God, every single time I try to stop, it's not working. 
so I need you to help me stop. And it's it's working. And so um, so I, so I've only had one in the last two months. And um, and it's one of those things that any other time that I would try to stop, Kenny eats sweets. I don't eat sweets. I don't like desserts or cakes or cookies or things like that. I drink my sweets. So sweet tea, Dr Pepper. Those are the two. Sweet tea, Dr Pepper, and water. That's really all I drink. And so, um, so when I would try to stop drinking Dr. Peppers, I would go to the store and I would get a Dr. Pepper and then I would get something sweet for Kenny, right? Because as long as he's eating a sweet, then it's okay if I have a Dr. Pepper, right? Um, my, my dad is this way. My dad is diabetic and um, all of the ladies in our church would make him cookies. He can't have those because dad can't eat one cookie. Um, and so they would make him those little crinkle cookies, you know, the chocolate crinkle cookie. Uh -huh. um, Miss Ruth made those crinkle cookies for Dad all the time. And I would go into his office and like open a drawer, and he'd have crinkle cookies in the drawer. And I was like, Dad, you're not supposed to have these. And he's like, Shh, if you close the drawer. Um, but he would get like he would get Mom a, a, a diet Dr Pepper, and then he has a crinkle cookie. So a lot of times that's how we treat accountability. Well, you can do that as long as I can do this, right? And that's not the way, the way accountability is supposed to work. The flip side of that is we don't like to hold people accountable because we know that we've messed up also, right? And so that becomes a problem. So when we, when we treat accountability that way, then nobody's held accountable for anything, right? And so that's a problem because this is one of our responsibilities within the body is to hold one another accountable. That's holding one another accountable. Um, like it says, how, consider how we can spur one another towards love and good deeds and not forsaking the assembling together. A lot of people have gotten out of the habit of fellowshipping with the body. We make all kinds of excuses for why we don't need to be a part of a body or why we can be inconsistent with being a part of a body. But what's the purpose? Like this is something that's important, it's vitally important, because we can't hold one another accountable if we're not there for them. How can we walk through life together with them if we're not there? Like that's incredibly important. So fellowship is our second one. The next one. <coughs> the next one is prayer. And I will tell you that prayer is one of the ones that, um, that I struggle with. <clears throat> and it's not... Um, it's not that I don't believe in the power of prayer. Um, when I was a kid, um, you're going to think I'm a terrible human for this, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Um, when I was a kid, uh, mom told me, you will always be my baby. That's what she told me when I was little. I'm going to be your baby. It's going to be awesome. And then she got pregnant. And she told me, and I was like, I thought I was always going to be your baby. And, um, and she was like, well, you know, I'm going to have another baby. And this is where I'm a terrible human. I prayed. I prayed for that baby to go away. And that, um, that night, mom began to bleed. And, um, and she called the doctor. And this was, you know, this was in the 80s. And, um, and you know, they didn't, they didn't do things the same way that they do. They would never tell you anything over the phone anymore. Um, but they told mom, you've lost the baby. Just come in tomorrow and we'll, we'll do a DNC and all that stuff. And I remember mom telling us that next morning that she had lost the baby. And I just began to cry because um, she was like, what's wrong? I was like, it's my fault. And she was like, no, it can't be your fault. I go, yes, no, it, it's my fault. And she was like, no, it's not your fault. I was like, I prayed for the baby to die last night. And she goes, Okay, why? And so I told her, you know, she said, we don't do that. And I was like, okay, I'll reverse it. And so I go and I begin to pray. And mom's like, they already told me I lost the baby, you know. And so uh, she goes to the hospital and they go, you didn't lose the baby. The baby's still here. We don't know why you're bleeding. But you're not bleeding anymore. And the baby's good and strong. And and I just remember thinking to myself, this prayer thing is powerful. And, um, and I began thinking, like, ha, ooh, uh, we have to be careful with this. 
But then somewhere along the way, I stopped praying the way I did when I was four. Somewhere along the way, um, I began to just tell myself, God knows what I need, so we're good. Um, in First Thessalonians, in First Thessalonians chapter five, verses sixteen through eighteen, Paul says, "Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus." Our prayer life is part of God's will for us. That is our communication with the Father, right? And it's two way, right? Um, so we wouldn't have a relationship with our spouse or, or our best friend or anything like that if we never communicated, right? That wouldn't be any kind of a relationship, but often that's how we treat the Lord. We say, oh yeah, I have a relationship with the Lord, but when's the last time you talked to him? Well, he knows, he knows all of him. It's kind of how we live our lives. This says that we're supposed to be praying without ceasing. Now, as a kid, I thought that when you had to walk around with your hands folded and your eyes closed, and I was like, how are we gonna get anything done? But that just means that our, we need to be in an attitude of prayer, constantly communicating with the Father, um, where we can talk to him about everything and anything throughout our day. It doesn't have to be out loud. Sometimes it can be in your heart. Sometimes um, it can be just in your mind. Like all of these things, those are parts of what we do. In Psalm 25, Verses 4 and 5, it says, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation, and for you I wait all the day. So as we're spending that time communicating with him and listening for what he has for us, he begins to reveal these things that he has for our lives. Those desires that he has for us become our desires also. And in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, he says, um, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So when you become a believer and you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit living within you, you have this gift, right? And, and so our prayers, sometimes um, I, I was speaking earlier with somebody and they were talking about, I don't even know what to pray. Have you ever come up to a situation where you just didn't know what to pray? You don't know the words? So, you know, if, when, I, when I was in high school, my best friend's boyfriend was killed in a car accident. And, um, and I just remember going to her house, not having a, any idea what I'm supposed to say. How am I supposed to pray for her? What do I what do, I do in this situation? Do I just sit? Just sit and be still and wait. And, um, and years later, she thanked me for that, um, which was, was strange. We didn't really talk about that season of life very much. But she just said, I was just so thankful that you didn't try to make me talk. That you didn't um, act like you knew what was going on. You didn't say anything. I said, it's because I felt really dumb the situation and I thought I would only sound dumber if I said something and she said but that's what I needed I needed you to just sit and wait and in those times when I didn't know what to pray the Holy Spirit living within me knows exactly what to pray he knows what she needs and so as I'm praying in the best way that I know how I have the Holy Spirit the, the very heart of God praying alongside me and so as you're going through life and sometimes it is crushing, and sometimes you're like, God, I don't even know what to say in this situation. He does. And he knows what God's will for you is. And so he begins to pray in accordance with his will for you. And that's incredibly powerful. That's incredibly um, life-changing that God does that with us and for us and through us. Um, because he knows our hearts. Yes, he does. So this is one of those ways where, where I would kind of get it twisted. I would say, well, if he knows, then I don't have to pray. Uh, but when the girls were little, this is a this is a Karis story. Um, Karis is um, wildly independent, and she has been since birth. And so um, I remember. I mean, she's like she's like one. She doesn't know how to tie shoes. Like she just doesn't. And we know she doesn't know how to tie her shoes. Um, but she thinks in her head, I should innately know how to tie my shoes. And so we see her struggling to tie her shoe 
and we know that she needs help tying this shoe. Um, and we offer help and she doesn't want it. And so we walk away and we're just watching. And we know she needs help tying her shoe. And um, she would struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. And then you would see a shoe fly across the room <laughs> and she would scream and cry. And, and we would say, do you need to go to your room for a bit? And she would go to her room for a bit and she would cry and be so angry. And then she'd try again. And sometimes we'd do this pattern multiple times. And then she would come and she would say, can you help me tie my shoe? And we'd say, yeah, we would have helped you from the very beginning. But yeah, we're going to help you tie your shoe. And so sometimes when we, when we pray, that is our way of expressing to the Lord, I'm acknowledging I cannot fix this. I'm acknowledging that you are the one who can. You're the one that has the power to do this. And so I am I'm exercising my trust in you. I am exercising my faith in you in this moment. And that's why prayer is incredibly important. It's a reminder to us that we are not able to do these things. Um, a lot of times we, we try to fix things on our own. I'm a fixer. I want to fix things. I don't like to ask for help. She comes by and honest. Like she gets it from me. I do not like to ask for help. Um, but we were never designed to not need help. We are designed to need the Father. We are designed to need the Master. And how beautiful it sounds to us when they come to us and acknowledge a need. When they come and say, I don't know what to do in this situation. Can you help me? Um, having kids has probably, probably been one of the best ways to help me understand the Lord. Um, because he must be incredibly frustrated sometimes with me or... But he's so patient as he sees me trying to tie a shoe that I don't know how to tie. He sees me throw that shoe across the room, and he's just waiting for me to, to say, can I help you? Or can you help me? And that's what he's waiting for. And so prayer is our opportunity to communicate that with the Father, to communicate that we need him. So um, we have to know our master. That's the first one. Um, the second thing, in order to, to walk in the 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 good works that he has for us, we need to know our gifts. Now, the, the Bible talks about spiritual gifts in multiple places. Um, there's not like a, there's not like an exhaustive list of these. Uh, depending on where you read, there's, there's different ones that are listed. <clears throat> but if we'll go, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get one. Oh, yeah. So um, in 1 uh, Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, now we read this one yesterday. Um, so at the very beginning of that, in verses 4 through 6, it talks about how um, the giftings are unique, right? And so there are many different gifts that the Holy Spirit gives out. It's not like there's one gift and you either get it or you don't. He has different gifts that he gives, okay? And in verses uh, 7 through 11, he tells us the purpose of these gifts, okay? The purpose of these gifts is to uh, for the good of the body, so for the common good. So we're supposed to be using those within our fellowship, Again, if you're not in fellowship, how in the world are you supposed to use your gift in the fellowship? Right? That's a, that's a major part of what we're supposed to do here. Um, in 1 Corinthians, if he keeps going in verses 14 through 26, he talks about how we have one body but many gifts. Um, and so we have this sometimes where, um, and this is the part where it talks about the eye and the ear, and if everything's the same thing, then, um, then it's not any good. Um, so everybody doesn't have the same gift. If your church was entirely made up of pastors, then no one's serving, right, in, in the other things. Um, and, a, and a lot of times we have this concept of, we, we begin to rank things, right? And we think this is more important than the other ones. Um, it's kind of like within our body, which, you know, Paul uses the metaphor of the body because this makes a lot of sense. Um, your pinky toe, right, is, okay, it's there. Um, what does it do? And you don't really see its significance until you hurt it, exactly. right? And when you hurt it, like your whole life is altered. When you hurt that little tiny pinky toe, your walk changes, right? Um, it affects everything. It just, it radiates pain like no other. It's so crazy that the tiny, this tiny little toe does that. Um, and so you would think of, of your toes, your you know, big toe is the most important. Well, your big toe helps with all your balance and things like that, but so does your baby toe. 
because when you hurt it, your balance is off, your walk is off, all of those things. There's so many things that we give like higher preference to, but without all of those things, if you don't have somebody that's cleaning your bathrooms, if you don't have somebody that's, uh, that's making food, thank the Lord for the men who are making food for us this week, then we wouldn't have food, right? We'd have to stop and do all these things, but they're serving us in this way. And so each one of you has a gifting that, that is designed for the common good. You have people that are, are amazing at prayer. Um, and, and we had some of these growing up and they would just, they would just come and let you know that they were praying for you and they were really great about it. And they, um, and that was just encouraging to me to know that somebody was praying for you. You have encouragers, people who would come alongside you and just encourage you in whatever stage of life that you were, just come alongside. You have people who have the gift of mercy. You have people who have the gift of teaching. You have people who have the gift of administration. You have people who have the gift, all these different gifts that God has given to each of us. Okay, so the question is, how are you serving? Because if you're not serving, then you're not using your gift. We weren't saved to sit in a pew once or twice or three times a week. Um, you were saved for these good works so that you can go and help the body and so that you can share the love of Christ out in the world. Right? So that's your job. Um, in Ephesians 4, chapters 11 through, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, he says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So um, some people's gifts are to help other people develop their gifts. Um, but the purpose of that is for the building up of the body of Christ. It says, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So whether or not you use your gift doesn't just impact you. It impacts the body. So as a body, if one part of you, if my pinky toe hurts, my whole body seems to hurt. It's very similar within the body of Christ. When one part of the body is not doing its job, it affects the entire body. Our gifts are used for the common good within the body to build us up. It talks about helping us to, to mature. So as we do that, we're helping one another to mature. And so service is a really big part of that and using your gifts. So you have to know your gifts. Now, if you don't know your gifts, there are countless spiritual gift inventories that you can do. You could just go online and type spiritual gifts test, and then you can take, there's online ones, there's paper ones, there's all kinds of things. Um, and if you've done one many moons ago, I'd encourage you to do another one. Because sometimes your giftings kind of change. Sometimes as you continue that masterpiece, right? Remember we talked about sometimes it's in layers, then God begins developing other things for you, um, which is really kind of cool. And so I would encourage you to do one of those. And sometimes the things that you think, because a lot of times we equate spiritual gifts with talents, right? And so we think, well, I, well, I'm talented at this, so that must be my spiritual gift, which is not always entirely true. Um, my dad, um, my dad did not like being in front of people. Um, and my dad originally began, um, he, was, he would sing. In church, that was like the very first thing that he did. And when he would sing, he would close his eyes. Not because he was trying to be more spiritual than everybody else. He would close his eyes because then he couldn't see anybody. Um, and then it wasn't that big of a deal. And it was one of those things that um, when people were like, I think you're supposed to be a pastor. And he was like, I don't think that that's what I'm supposed to do because I don't want to be in front of people. But as the Lord continued working in him and through him, he began developing these 
gifts within him, so that dad is probably the best pastor I've ever had in my life. Um, he loves people well. He shepherds people well. He has patience. He has kindness. And these were not things that were that people would have said about him growing up. I remember one time when I was, um, this is when we had call ID, and the phone rang and it said out of area, and I was like, okay. So I answered it, and um, when the guy was like, uh, hey, is uh, Richard there? And nobody ever called my dad Richard, and I was like, sure. Uh, hey, Richard, somebody's on the phone for you. And so dad gets on the phone, he says, hello. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I am. Okay, all right, bye. That was the end of the conversation. I was like, that was short. He said, it was a guy I went to high school with. Um, and I said, well, how did he get your number? He was like, I don't know. He said, but he, he called and he was laughing. He said, I heard the funniest thing the other day. I heard you're a pastor now. And he said, well, I am. And he goes, oh, okay then. Well, I'll talk to you later. And that was the end of their conversation. Um, he was just completely thrown by the fact that who dad was was not who he, he is now. Um, he was a new creature, a new creation, but people helped him. That's the importance of that fellowship part right there, right? They encouraged him in his gifts. And sometimes we hear those things. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you where somebody says, you're gifted at this. And you go, mm, I don't know about that. But um, God uses other people in fellowship to help us to grow in our giftings. Um, and sometimes we don't have confidence in these things, right? We don't have confidence that we can do what God is, is calling us to do. And the truth of the matter is, in your own power, you, you can't. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. That's why you need His gift. That's why you need to be abiding in Him so that you can produce that fruit. And so that's who we are with, um, with our spiritual gifts. And then the next thing that you need to know is you have to use them. Once you know what your gift is, what good is having a gift if you're not going to use it? Right? If I, if I get a gift at Christmas... And then I go, oh, what a pretty gift. And then I just set it to the side. And I don't ever open it. I don't ever, then it's worthless. It's the same way with our spiritual gifts. We've got a whole lot of people that have spiritual gifts just kind of sitting inside of them doing nothing. Just collecting dust. And they weren't designed to, to be that way. If you give a kid a gift, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But you're going to open it, right? We're going to play with it immediately. Like, that's what, that's what they do. But sometimes, as we get older and we get this gift, we go, oh, God, but I don't really know if I want to go and be on the hospitality team and talk to strangers. Like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. But God's saying, no, that's what I've designed you for. I need you to go and do that. Because I have this designed for you, and I have equipped you to do it. Now, somebody else could do it, right? Um, and a lot of times, that's what we see. If you look at statistics... Um, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's like 10% of the people within the church do 90% of the work. And so we have a lot of people who, um, who come to church just to get, and then they go. Um, and, and, you know, they think to themselves, somebody else will do that, or somebody will take care of that. And a lot of times, it's because we don't know what to do. Um, sometimes people are waiting for somebody to ask them to do something. Uh, Kenny's like that. 